This conference will now be recorded. Hi, I'm Preston Williams, and welcome to another edition of Jazz Talk. Today on our show, we have a very special guest. This gentleman is a member of one of the greatest bands of all time. I'm talking iconic. And if I name some of the songs, you'll know exactly who I'm talking about. Songs like Mighty Mighty, Shining Star, That's the Way of the World, Getaway, September, Serpentine Fire, After the Love is Gone, Got to Get You Into My Life, Let's Groove, I can go on and on. Now, this gentleman is a uh, special person. He's a He's been a part of Earth, Wind & Fire for 50 years. He's a singer, songwriter, producer, and drummer. We call him Mr. Ralph Slick Johnson. Ralph, welcome to Jazz Time. <laughs> well, thank you. Good to be here. Good to you see know, you, man. Thanks so much as, for joining us. As, as we deal with our new norm on a daily <laughs> basis, you know, exactly. this quarantine thing is starting to get on my nerves, actually. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been hearing that from a lot of musicians. You know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a former member uh, of uh, Earth, Wind & Fire on our show. Sheldon Reynolds joined us. And okay, uh, yeah. you know, we, we reminisced a little bit. But, you know, Ralph, we know you, of course, uh, from Earth, Wind & Fire. But one thing that we don't know that much about are your humble beginnings. I understand that you are from Los Angeles, California. And uh, just curious about your upbringing, how you got involved in music, uh, how did you uh, start playing drums? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, yeah, you're right. I'm from L.A. And I took my first drum lesson at uh, eight years old. Wow. And uh, just, yeah. Fell in love with it, and uh, you know, always I was always with the teacher, always studying. And then, and when I was at Twenty uh, Fourth Street Elementary School, I joined the orchestra, mm -hmm. and I just kept playing throughout school. Always had a band, you know, and uh, so in nineteen December of nineteen seventy one, I auditioned for Earth, Wind, and Fire. They had seen me play at a club here in L.A. called Mavericks Flat. Yeah, uh, yeah, and. Uh, I was playing with a group called the Masters Children. Masters and Children. they saw me play. Maurice Burdine came in. And um, next thing I knew, I was getting a phone call. And they asked me if I wanted to audition uh, for the band. Now, so I did the audition. And didn't Michael Bill help uh, with that whole thing, that process? Michael Bill. Oh, somebody's done their research. Whoa, look out. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, Michael I'm, Bill. I'm a historian. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, because Michael was out of Mavericks also. And uh -huh. he was the first one to get out of there. And I remember us, all of us who were part of the Mavericks organization, cheering him on. Gotcha. And uh, next thing I knew, I was getting a phone call and they were like, man, what? You know, so uh, that's that's really how it all started. You know? Now, let's go, let's go back even a little bit before then. You were playing in a group called the Teen Turbans. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about yeah. that. Man. Yeah. The Teen Turbans. Yeah, that was a group I was in in uh, junior high school. And uh, mm -hmm. It was, it was a really together band. Matter of fact, we won the, the local pop station, KSJ 93 here in L.A., yeah. uh, through a battle of the bands, which they held at the Hollywood Palladium. And, man, okay. we took first place. And I, I can still tell you the date. It was the night of May 10th, 1966. Wow. That was the year I was born. Wow. <laughs> 1966. Well, well, how old am I? You know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, tell me, Ralph. Um. Who were some of your influences at that time? Because I guess, were you listening to like jazz music as a kid growing up? Well, actually as a teenager growing up, but I mean, okay. you know, first off in LA, there was a radio station for every genre of music. Okay. So whatever you wanted to listen to, you could find a station that was supporting that. But when my older brother, who was born on the same day I am, which is July 4th, mm -hmm. came home from the Air Force, he had this incredible vinyl collection of jazz and I started listening to that and I just happened to stumble upon the local uh, jazz station which was KBCA 105.1 mm -hmm. and fell in love with the, fell in love with the personalities that I was hearing on the on-air personalities you know each job had their own special I said man I got to get into broadcasting but that's right. that's how I started getting into jazz that was around 65 mm -hmm. and it just continued from there you know and uh, oh. still today I love my my jazz you know who are some of your uh, influences as far as drummers are concerned? Who do you like? Well, shoot. Um, well, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta talk about Buddy Rich because he's yeah. Mr. Drum. Yes. You know, but because I like big band swing, that's the other part of that. 
Okay. But I mean, like Elvin Jones, Art Blakey, Max Roach, Roy Haynes. Oh, yeah. Uh, and these are all jazz cats. Um, right. Jack D. Jeanette. You Tony know. Williams, of course. But it, and thank you very much. I got a great story about Tony Williams. Um, I had never seen Tony Williams. And so at the early 90s, when Tony was still alive, there was a club here in L.A., which is still here, a jazz spot called Catalina's. Mm-hmm. It was on Coenga Boulevard then. Now it's on Sunset. But gotcha. I took a student of mine. I took a student of mine to see Tony. And man, Tony played so much stuff that night. Wow. That I walked out of there depressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Tony, Tony definitely, no doubt about Tony Williams, man. You know. So uh, yeah. those are some of my influences. You know. Um, gotcha. But I try. I try to listen to everybody. You know, and try and yeah. get a little bit. Gotta my my love here. really, my love is in teaching, you know, oh, it was, okay. oh yeah, no, I love to teach. As a matter of fact, two weeks ago, I posted on Facebook that I would teach drummers for nothing and we would do it online, you know, by way of Zoom or Facebook Messenger. And uh, they had, there were certain books they had to have uh, if they wanted me to do this. And so, yeah, I love to teach. I absolutely love it. You know, beautiful, beautiful. You know, in yeah. those uh, those early years with Earth, Wind and Fire and I, I interviewed Maurice back in by phone in 2007 and he just talked about he says we really depended on Ralph early in those days. Now, I noticed the music that you guys did in that period of, you know, last days and times uh, head to the sky. You guys are more jazz oriented. And I heard Maurice say a lot of people kept saying you guys, you know, are R&B band. He says we're not an R&B band. We're jazz musicians who play popular music. And I heard Philip Bailey say, we're, yeah. a fusion, we're a fusion band turned commercial. But I noticed, well, that's um, true. you know, in the early days, you guys were more, like I said, you know, uh, jazz oriented you guys doing songs like Zanzibar, which is, wow, a masterpiece. And uh, yeah, I'm mean, great to spas- spasmodic moves on Open yes. Our Eyes. Open Our Eyes. You exactly. Know. Exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, one. Sorry. No, I was going to say that was probably due to Maurice's influence because. As you know, Maurice was a jazz drummer. He came from the Ramsey Lewis Trio. Mm-hmm. And so exactly. he brought that with him when he put together uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. So naturally, the jazz influence would carry over, you know. Right, right. Now, Ralph, in the early days, um, were when you guys did recordings, was it mainly him on drums, or did you play sometimes on the recordings when you guys were in the studio? You guys just switched back and forth? We had. We had three drummers that were recorded with uh, mm-hmm. myself, Freddie White, and Maurice. Right. Okay. Now, I wanted so, to ask you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. No, go ahead. Now, I was going to ask you um, in 1974, I think when uh, Fred came into the band, I was watching the California Jam. And like you guys were one of the only few bands that I noticed that had two drummers you know, on stage yes. performing, which was interesting. How did that affect you? Because you had actually been the drummer for those first three years, and then eventually you moved up front and started singing. And then sometimes I would see you go in the back and play drums. Did you like that role, or is that just something that Maurice suggested? Well, hey, it kind of it kind of caught me off guard. Um, but both Freddie and I adjusted quickly. I mean, because uh-huh. we had no choice. Gotcha. <laughs> you had to move. You had to move. The, you had to move the ego stuff to the side and get down to the business of the music of the band. Gotcha. Uh, the way I wound up out front singing, uh, we were filming Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Mm-hmm. And at that time, our choreographer was George Faison, George Faison. who, as you know, choreographed, choreographed The Wiz on Broadway. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And we were setting up our, our shot to do Got to Get You Into My Life, which, by the way, was a track I actually played drums on. And um, um, George was looking at the shot because he had Maurice and Philip out front. Uh, and he was looking and he was looking and he said, he pointed back and says, Ralph, come here, come off the drums. Grab a mic and stand right here next to Maurice. And mm. that was the beginning of me being out front. And I never got back on the drums after that. They wanted me out you know, front. Interesting. I saw there's a, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, the someone found your um, the tour that you guys did in 76, the spirit tour. And I see you playing drums, but I also see you up front sometimes beside Maurice, you guys are singing, Johnny Graham is beside you. So you were like back and forth. I noticed that. And uh, you yes. seem like, that, yeah, you seem like you really like that you were comfortable in that role. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm thankful that I had somewhat of a voice that I could, you know, 
you know, I, that I'd be able to handle the, that position, you know. But yeah, I used to move back and forth, and then finally I just wound up all the way out front. Mm. Now, I noticed you guys really enjoyed going to uh, Caribou Ranch, Colorado, when you guys did some of those Im uh, important albums like Open Our Eyes and That's the Way of the World. Did you guys like that place because of the sound? Because a lot of bands were going up there during that time period. Was it something about just that place that you guys wanted to record and get away from California, or was it well, something... Well, certainly that was part of the reason we went there, just to be away from distractions in the right. city. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, it was a very popular ranch slash recording studio to go to. Right. It was owned by a gentleman by the name of James William Gersio, who okay. produced both Chicago and Blood, Sweat and Tears. Gotcha. OK. OK. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Now, um, during that time period, uh, you guys worked with the late Charles Stepney, who, who was a genius, you know, great arranger. Uh, of course, he discovered many, many Ripperton and he worked with other people. But what was it like working with him and what did he add to Earth, Wind and Fire to take you guys to that next level? Well, he had incredible compositional skills and incredible arranging skills. Mm. And him and Maurice had already dealt with each other in Chicago. So gotcha. he was bringing songs and bringing arrangements and production capabilities also, you know. So, and was a great, great person to be around, very knowledgeable. You could mm -hmm. ask him anything. You say, oh yeah, I remember him. I remember sitting down with him at Caribou while we were working on That's Way of the World. And uh, there's a passing chord, what we call a passing chord in, mm -hmm. in, in the song. And I asked him, I said, what is that song? He says, oh, that's a, Dominant seven flat five. I said, oh man, okay, cool. You know, mm. so very always, you know, a great mentor, you know, and knew his stuff exactly. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, uh, Charles had already worked with Minnie Ripperton in mm -hmm. her early days. That's right. Know. Come to my garden. There was another, <laughs> yeah, that beautiful album. There yeah. was another group he did that Minnie was a part of. Um, called the Rotary Connection. The Rotary Connection, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And it's funny too. Uh, you meant we mentioned that album, "Come to My Garden." You know, Maurice is on that along with Ramsey Lewis, uh, and uh, just one of many's best. You know, I, I love that recording. But um, right. I was I, I was going to ask you, um, you know, in your role as a drummer, did you? I was just going to say, do you prefer, I mean, now, of course, you're out front singing, but do you sort of miss being behind that drum set and just playing like, like you did before? I noticed I was looking at some old concerts and you were just rolling on the drums. I mean, just the rhythm and everything. For instance, uh, the 1973 appearance that you guys did on that TV show, Soul. I mean, you were rolling. Oh, man. Wow, well, that's, boy, you, well, you're going way back, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, you know what? I do miss playing with the band. I really do. That's that's. There's nothing like being surrounded by a big band. You know, mm -hmm. surrounded by some cats who can really play. So yeah, mm -hmm. I do. But you know, uh, I make up for it in other ways. That's why. That's why I jumped out on a smooth jazz career so I could just get some of that playing thing out of me. You know. Right. Right. You know. And getting back real quick to Charles Stepney, when I interviewed Maurice, he told me something very interesting that I didn't know. He said Charles was a student of pianist Bud Powell. And Bud is the most influential pianist in jazz history. Every, you know, pianist from Herbie Hancock, McCoy Tyner, they'll all tell you Bud is like what Charlie Parker was to saxophone. He was that, of course, to piano. So, you know, he just talked about he was an exceptional uh, musician. Um, right. But, but I wanted to tell you, uh, I've heard the band, I've heard certain members of the band uh, say that that's the way of the world. And all in all are probably our two best recordings. And Verdine has even said, all in all is another level. I mean, that was the band at their pinnacle best. What is it about that album? Because I was reading an article where you yourself even said the first side of All in All is just, you know, what is it about that recording, Ralph? Well, you know what it gets down to. First, Preston, it's about the songs. Mm -hmm. That album, All in All, and that's the way the world, but All in All, man, had great, great songs. And now you combine that with very excellent production. Mm -hmm. And you combine that with a very excellent engineer who at that time was George Massenburg. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, and it was, it was unstoppable. You know, it's just one of those things. And then 
you go to the cover art, yeah, you know, which was part of the packaging, you know, because you got to think about all that. You got to mm-hmm. think about your packaging and all of that, you know. So it's you know it gets down, man, Preston. It gets down to the songs and the production. You so know? you you guys actually it went to a new level because every time you guys dropped an album, I remember in the '70s it was like a big thing. This is before social media. Man, did you hear Earth, Wind, and Fire about to come out with an album? That each album seemed to get better. It's like that's the way of the world. Then gratitude and something about right. gratitude, Ralph. A lot of people don't know. Peter Frampton, when he came out with uh, Frampton Comes Alive, that was sort of the standard. When you guys did uh, Gratitude, that just went to a new level. And they said today, that particular recording is one of the greatest live recordings ever, ever. And it's like the standard. You guys set a standard with that. Uh, it was just incredible. And uh, like I said, everything that you guys touched just kept getting better and better and better and better. Now, one of the things that blows me away to this day is just all the things that you guys have done. I mean, the accolades. I mean, you guys were the first African American band to sell out Madison Square Garden, the first African American right. band to tour the world without an opening act. Uh, you guys sold out Wembley Arena five nights or something like that in a row. I was reading, which was incredible. Uh, the first band to get the Kennedy Center Honors Award, which you guys won last year. I mean, just unbelievable. And that doesn't even include all the other things like the Hollywood Walk of Fame, the uh, Grammy Lifetime, the BET. Everything that you guys have done is just incredible. And you guys have sort of set a standard. I heard Verdine say every he said there's never been a band to put out that many records in succession, one right after another for that long period of time that were that quality. Basically, like from the say that's the way of the world all the way through, like, uh, you know, Ray's. No band has put that, right. that, that is just, just incredible. Now, one of the things that I've been impressed with with you is just some of your production work. I know that you work with uh, and just uh, you did music with um, Stanley Turrentine, uh, Howard Hewitt. And I love the stuff that you did with Saida Garrett. That Christmas song you guys yeah. did about that was what you, beautiful. What do you man. know about that? What do you, come I on know, now, what do you know I about listen, that? I listen, man, that was beautiful. What you did, saw you singing with her on there, and uh, yeah, it was real, real nice. I'm like, wow, this is Ralph. You know, it was uh, it was really, really good, man. Really good. You know, well, and uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful lady, incredible talent, mm. just a beautiful spirit. And we first got together as you know what on my bucket list. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had three things, one I've accomplished, but one of those things was to write a Christmas song. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I wanted to write a Christmas song. Uh, and uh, it was called Have a Very Merry Christmas. And, um, mm-hmm. but I said, man, you know, the Christmas song is cool, but it's seasonal. Mm-hmm. So I had to come back and rethink and then we did something that I wrote with my partner, Marcel East, who's the younger brother of bassist Nathan East. Nathan East, yeah. Uh, we, wrote, we, we wrote a thing called Aura, Embrace That's Your Life. I remember, I remember that. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, you know, that kind of, you know, turned the direction for us, you know. So every now and then I'll come up with a track and I'll say, man, I wonder if I should call Saida on this. Because she's always <laughs> ready to do something, you know, and she's right. easy to work with. Just a, Just a beautiful lady. You know? Yeah, yeah, and even your production work that you did with uh, Al McKay, when you work with the Temptations, treat her like a lady. I love that, man. I love that. Man, that thank was, you. Yeah, that was really good stuff. Now, Ralph, let's you talk know, about. Funny. I was, I was going to say it's funny because I, I, I cruised over to Al's one day. He was living in the Los Feliz area over uh-huh. by Griffith Park, and I cruised over there, and he. It, I'm sorry, your sound went out. I can't hear you. Oh, okay. there we go. Yeah, you went out. I couldn't hear your sound or something. Went, had yeah, gone somebody out. was trying to call in. Are you, wait, hold on one. You okay now? Perfect. Now, for some reason, your, your sound has, uh, uh, I'm not hearing you like I was. Say something. Yeah, can you can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I barely I hear. You know what I might do? Just give me one second. Okay, take your time. Take your time. Technical difficulty. I'm gonna see if I can hook up my head. What happens when a okay. phone call comes in? Okay. But I want to finish the story. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Can you hear Hold me? On. Ah, ah, there we go. Okay. Now I can hear you. 
Excuse oh, great. Me. Excuse the headphones. No, no, no problem. No so problem. I thought Al, I thought Al was kidding. He says, no, man. He says, Motown called me. They want me to do this album. I want you to help. And we had a wonderful, wonderful time working with the Timps. And then Ali Woodson who was the lead singer, mm -hmm. came up with Treat It Like a Lady. And man, uh -huh. Ali went in the studio and did that song in one take. What a great song, man. Yeah. That was a powerful track. I'm, yeah, I remember when I heard it. Yeah, it. yeah, we had, a, we had a lot of fun with the Timps, man. A lot of fun, you know. Man, so great. yeah, that was one of my production things, you know. So did some work with Howard. Yeah, um, Howard Hewitt, yep. Um, did, his Chris, did his Christmas record. Yeah. Um, uh, did a, and I did another album um, for him also. And uh, Howard and I go way back. Really? Way back. Um, I discovered Howard. Really? At, at that club, Maverick's Flat. We were both Maverick's on the dance Flat. floor with the ladies. Wow. There it is again. And man, I, and he'll tell you, and uh, the song that was on was um, LTD's Love Ballad. Oh, uh, wow. And, wow. Yeah. And so I heard this voice. Or I hear this. Yeah, I hear this voice over there singing along. I said, so I'm dancing with my lady. I'm starting to move over, you know, trying to get closer to this voice. It was, how are you doing? Wow. And I asked him, I said, man, uh, would you like to do some recording? He said, yeah, I'd love to. So I used him on some demos. And then we just been the, I spoke with him the other day, just the other day, you know. Wow, that's incredible. Now, Ralph, we look at we know you as a renaissance man because you do everything, man. You play tennis. You're a chef. Uh, you do martial arts. I think I talked to you years ago and I was asking you, I says, are you still studying Tang Sudo? You said, yeah, absolutely. And uh, play tennis. I mean, you well, do it all. And also you make some nice sweet potato pies, too, that I saw that you posted on your uh, oh, Facebook page. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I messed around the kitchen a little bit. I mean, it's, I, it's not like, um, you know, CIA trained, but. Uh, right. Right. You know, uh, no, I, I like to get in the kitchen and mess around. And uh, yeah, uh, I thoroughly enjoy the martial arts. Uh, mm -hmm. I do have two black belts. Uh, I'm a first degree in Tong Sudo, but I'm a third degree in a style of uh, Kung Fu known as San Su. OK. You know, so, okay. yeah, I, you know, yeah, you're also very much you're into it. You know, you're also a wine connoisseur, too, aren't you? Well, I, I enjoy a little red, you know. <laughs> I, I appreciate a great Zinfandel, right? You know, right. or a nice Pinot Noir, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I uh, I uh, discovered. Well, actually, you uh, you shared it with me. Tell us about this new song that you came out a couple of months ago, "Smooth and You." Man, I really like that tune. Man, thank you so much. Was it, was uh, it Smooth and Gerald, You? Gerald Clayton. Gerald Clayton. Gerald Clayton, Gerald Clayton, yeah. and there's a story there because my youngest son, Mark Anthony, married Gerald's sister, Gina uh, Clayton. Okay. And both Gina and Gerald are the daughter and son of world class bassist John Clayton. Ah, uh, okay. Now, if you don't know who John Clayton is, all you need to do is go online and bring up Whitney Houston Star Spangled Banner because he did the arrangement. Mm, I remember when she sang that too, 1990 or 91 or something like that. Yeah, I remember that. That's a brilliant arrangement. Yeah. You will yeah. never hear another arrangement like that on the Star Spangled Banner, you know? And so anyway, last year I said, man, you know what? I think I'm gonna break out a little bit and do something different. Mm -hmm. So I decided I was gonna go into jazz. And my first release last year was something called Cold Swagget. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, this year, I said, you know what? It's time for a second release. And um, we did uh, Smooth and You, written by Ray Crosley, Raymond Crosley, who I've known since we were teenagers. Mm -hmm. And um, and I went, I, you know, at first I was going to release it on Ray, who's an excellent keyboardist. Mm -hmm. But Ray comes to me and he says, you know, Ralph, man, I don't know if I want to do this just now. Let's can we get another keyboard player? So I had my choice. I could have gotten our musical director, Myron McKinley, Myron. who's incredible. Yes. Um, or I could have went and got Larry Dunn. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I said, you know what? I think I'm gonna hit on Gerald, who's an incredible straight ahead mainstream jazz pianist. And I was mm -hmm. a little hesitant. 
because I didn't know if he being a lot of jazz cats don't want to quotation marks uh, sell out yeah. by doing smooth jazz. Yeah. Because it's not the pure stuff. But he said, yeah, Ralph, let's do it. You know, and so on uh, December 17th of last year, mm -hmm. uh, myself and Gerald went over to Ray Parker Jr.'s state of the art studio mm -hmm. and laid down that incredible piano you hear on Smooth and You. So, yeah, man, that's that. So it's doing very well. We're seven weeks, seven weeks into um, the uh, promotion campaign is doing quite well. You Good. Know? I'm Good. very happy with it. Now, Ralph, you play drum, so you know. Okay. Well, like I said, you know, you've been playing. You guys have, you know, been around for 50 years. Earth, Wind, and Fire. Do you ever? Let me ask you this: of all those years of touring, going out on the road, do you ever get tired and like? Do you ever say, Philip and Verdine, man, can we just, you know, take off for a while? And of course, everyone is quarantined right now. But sometimes, do you just feel like, man, I just don't feel like doing this tour right now. And maybe we should just take off for a while. Or what keeps you inspired? What keeps you going? Uh, to want to do this. Never said, I've, never, I've never said to Dean or Phil that, hey, man, I need a break. I got you. If we strike up the tour, then the, the three of us are in it. Gotcha. Okay. You know, and so and Phil's the time that the three of us decide, well, it's time to hang it up. Then we'll hang it up. But, man, we have consistently, consistently put butts in. Yes, you definitely do that. You definitely do that. You think about a lot of the bands that were around when you guys were, were, you know, even in your heyday in the 70s, a lot of those bands are not around anymore. You guys are still out there with all these different generations, you know, of people. So uh, who, uh, who love Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. The I can sound, hear you. Man, the sound went away again. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Nice and clear. I can yeah, but I can, now I can't hear you, man. What? Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, don't worry about the technical difficulties that happens. I was uh, interviewing John Patitucci. Uh, basis John Patitucci last week and we had a similar situation so it's okay man it's technology it's okay oh man um I can hear I can hear you fine now can you hear me barely barely your your volume is your volume is very low on this end I can't even hear you in my headphones now okay can you hear me and now I try to oh there you go doesn't seem to do any good, but yeah can you hear me now I barely, but go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, of all the things that you guys have done over the years, all the awards, all the accomplishments, what are you most proud of or what stands out in your mind? What are you most proud of? Um, well, the most recent took place in December mm. with the Kennedy Center Honors. Yes. There is no higher award for an artist in the United States of America than a Kennedy Center Honor. It is equivalent Amazing. to being knighted in the UK. Before yes. that, we were installed in the um, Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Mm -hmm. I remember that. So those two things, one was in November, one was in December. And um, you can't you can't beat that. You know, the, mm -hmm. that's I don't know. Look, unless you want to give me a Nobel Prize for something, <laughs> you know, I you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, man, uh, it has been an honor and a pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, we love you. We love your music very much. Uh, as you've probably heard it a million times, your music is the soundtrack to our lives. And uh, keep it going, man. Keep it going. You know, it's beautiful. And uh, as the saying goes. Well, thank you, Preston. Thank you for having me, man. I really enjoyed it. You were asking great questions and you certainly did your research. And I appreciate you having me on your show. Thank you. And I always end by saying this. If the music grooves and makes you move, it must be jazz. I'm Preston Williams with Jazz Talk signing off. Peace.